Report.com is titled, Can We Restore America's Loss of Agency Amidst a World Gone Insane? Agency, and, and, the, and, the, and the frame of this, the whole, the whole big thing is that the Supreme Court has basically turned our lives over to the billionaires and giant corporations, and that has left Americans feeling powerless and angry. Um, agency is the ability to control yourself and your own life. Loss of agency is a psychological term and sociological term for people no longer being able to influence the course of their own life or the world around them. The phrase is usually used or often used to describe the situation of what are usually women suffering from severe spousal abuse. They're physically and psychologically beaten and physically beaten into submission, uh, locked in their homes, unable to work, afraid to even connect with friends and family. They have lost agency lost control over their lives. But it also describes far less severe situations, like when people in the workplace lose control of their work lives because of unregulated markets, when they can't provide for themselves or their families because of poverty, or when they want social or political change but are regularly thwarted by bought-off politicians like, you know, every Republican and Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema. It's sometimes described as a loss of power, but it's really much, much bigger than that. And I would argue that Tucker Carlson's recent attacks on Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and his uh, incredibly insulting uh, pet name for her, he calls her Sandy, uh, is a classic example of how a commentator or TV show host can convert his viewer's sense of political loss of agency into outrage. And when you step back a little bit, you see that this loss of agency is actually impacting Americans in a huge way in several different categories of our lives. The first and obvious one is the workplace. Over the last 40 years of Reaganomics and Reagan's war on unions, you know, we've gone from a third of Americans being unionized to about 6%. People have lost any power, any agency in the workplace. And wages have been flattened all this time. This, again, the, the consequences of Reaganomics. This all started, by the way, this has been a Republican strategy for a long time. This started in 1947 when Harry Truman vetoed the, the Taft-Hartley Act and Congress overrode his veto. He said that this would contain, it contained seeds of discord that would plague this nation for years to come. Americans have lost agency, lost power, lost a sense of control, of self-control, of, of supervision of their lives, have lost that in the workplace. The second area where we have lost agency is in the political sphere. 12 years ago this year, the Supreme Court in 2010 in their Citizens United decision declared that it was perfectly legal for billionaires and corporations to uh, sponsor or own politicians. And we went from corporations making a few hundred million dollars a year in contributions or in political participation to billions of dollars a year in, uh, per election year in, in political contributions. And as a consequence of this, there's this whole long list of things that when you do polling, the vast majority of the American people want. I mean, absolute unanimity across the board. And yet, we don't get. And we don't get them because our politicians, Kirsten Sinema, Joe Manchin, and every single Republican, have been bought off. Whether it's cheaper drugs, nationwide single-payer health care, a cleaner environment, stronger social security, postal banking, a higher minimum wage, low-cost, high-speed broadband, mass transit, predatory, ending predatory bank behavior, an end to student debt or the breakup of giant corporations so entrepreneurialism can again blossom in America, corporations and billionaires have paid off state and federal legislators to block all of these in defiance of voters. And this is why Congress right now polls lower than the question, should America turn communist? Was uh, <laughs> Congress is polling lower than Richard Nixon did during the Watergate. Congress right now is polling lower than the Internal Revenue Service. It's also frozen Congress's ability to accomplish anything of substance. Over, you know, uh, over a thousand pieces of law, beca uh, pieces of legislation became a law in 1982. Now that's below 200. We just, you know, Congress just doesn't do anything be uh, anymore except basically name post offices. So as a consequence, American voters having, you know, feeling this loss of agency with regard to politics are turning to liars and demagogues like Donald Trump and, and the whole, you know, Republican caucus who say, you know, oh, we'll solve your problems. Just put us in charge. Everything will be fine. 
And they're also turning to anti-government groups like these militias and the people who stormed the Capitol on January 6th. Another area where there's this incredible loss of agency is for women in the United States. In 1961, the FDA authorized the first hormonal birth control pill. It was the first legal oral contraceptive in the, in the world, in history. Uh, you know, that was really, really effective, had very few side effects, 1961. But in 1961, it was against the law in many states for married couples, much less anybody else, to possess birth control pills or any other kind of birth control. It was illegal in Connecticut to own a condom if you were a married couple. This was the, you know, the impact of, of largely the Catholic Church over the years. And so in 1965, the U.S. Supreme Court in Griswold v. Connecticut overturned those laws and, and said married people can have contraceptives. But it was still illegal for single people to have contraceptives or for single women to get an IUD or a diaphragm or even own or possess condoms. That happened in 1972 when the Supreme Court legalized ownership of birth control, possession of birth control for unmarried men and women. And then in 1963, you got Roe v. Wade. And the consequence of these three decisions, 65, 72, and 73, legalizing birth control for married people, legalizing it for unmarried people, and then legalizing abortion, the consequence of these three things was that women now had control over their reproductive capacity, over their own bodies, and could enter the workplace and started saying, yeah, and we'd like to do that, and going to college in large numbers. And, you know, you had this whole women's movement that emerged in the 1970s. It was a big deal. I was there. I remember it well. And the backlash to that was substantial. Limbaugh came out and called these women feminazis. There were conservative commentators saying that they were witches. Others were claiming it was a lesbian takeover. I mean, all, the, 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 the old right to life, in 1973, the right to life movement was the anti-death penalty movement. They were opposed to people getting put to death for, for you know, in prisons. That movement got hijacked by the anti-abortion movement and the Catholics. And, and then, you know, in 1980, the, the white Protestant evangelical uh, denominations joined with the Catholics. And, and now you've got this, this all-out attack on the rights and powers of women. And this is what's truly astonishing, absolutely astonishing, is that uh, in Michigan, the attorney general, the De Democratic attorney general is named Dana Nessel, and there are three men running in the Republican primary to replace her, to, to be the candidate who will oppose her in the general election in November. All three of them were asked at a candidate forum last week, were asked what should be done about Griswold v. Connecticut. Keep in mind, Griswold v. Connecticut was the 1965 Supreme Court decision that made it legal for married couples to have birth control in their home. Condoms. It was a crime before that. All three of these Republican men who are running to unseat Dana Nessel said that Griswold was wrongly decided and should be overturned. In other words, they want to go back to, this isn't just about abortion. This is about all forms of birth control. Then another area where we've got this loss of agency, men, getting pushed out of the workplace by women, in their minds anyway, and, and, and to some extent in reality. And Reagan's war on unions, diminishing the number of jobs that were being competed over, led to this sense of loss of agency by men in America. Particularly white men, but this, this is pretty transracial uh, across races. And so guns, being the obvious stand-ins for powerful penises, fit the bill perfectly for something that would make men feel like their masculinity, their agency was being taken from them. And this was the basis of that lawsuit, that $73 million lawsuit that was settled last week, where Remington is going to pay $73 million to nine Sandy Hook families. And the reason why is because Remington, among other gun companies and the NRA, they realized that men were feeling a loss of agency as a consequence of women coming into the workplace in the 70s and 80s. And they started marketing weapons to men as a way to increase their sense of masculinity. This whole men's rights movement we merged in with the, with the gun movement 
And, uh, you know, they said that owning a gun was the key to being a, quote, real man. They said they, they had ads about, you know, punch your man card and engage in manly activities like eating meat instead of tofu and owning a big gun. And, you know, they made billions. But as we pass the threshold in the last 20 years, where we now have more guns than we do Americans, we've seen this explosion in child, accidental child deaths, mass shootings, suicides, and murders. We added 40 million guns to the United States just during the pandemic. Just during the two years of the pandemic. And we're seeing it now in the murder rates. Murder rates are going through the roof particularly, by the way, in rural red states and counties. The murder rates on a per capita basis, you don't have more absolute murders because the population is so low, but the percentage of people committing murders with guns is higher in red states and red counties than it is in blue. So, which brings us to the Republican Party, which is the epicenter of all of this stuff, of the misogyny, of the guns, of everything. Now you've got, you know, for example, flight attendants saying that they want to be able to put, uh, you know, belligerent passengers on the no-fly list. And you've got eight Republican senators who wrote to the uh, Department of Homeland Security saying, no, don't do that. You got Ted Cruz ranting that when Joe Biden said he was only, he was going to put a black woman on the court, that he was uh, being, that that should be illegal, that that was somehow racist. I pointed this out last week. I've been pointing it out for the 19 years I've been doing this show. When a political party has no actual policy plans, has no actual core beliefs, other than supporting billionaires and right-wing and, and big corporations, they fall back on de demagoguery, misogyny, and racism. Nixon blazed this trail with his Southern strategy. Bush the elder fine-tuned it with Willie Horton. And Donald Trump laid it right out in the open for everybody to see. And this is, this is the crisis that we have. Our, America, our, our American political system has been hijacked by billionaires. Our cultural systems have been hijacked by voices like Fox and social media that sow hate and division for profit. You've got toxic masculinity driving hate crimes and murders and air rage. And more than half of Americans are so desperately hanging on by their fingernails that they can't deal with an unexpected $1,000 expense. This is a powder keg. Now, progressive Democrats are offering Americans a way out of this, and thus a way towards our nation becoming what the founders laid out at least as an ideal, that we all, all of us, are created equal and have the equal right to pursue life, liberty, and the, and the pursuit of happiness. And we can undo some of the damage that Republicans have done with 40 years of Reaganomics. But that's going to require all of us showing up at the polls in November and getting active right now. So, you want the whole rant, plus uh, Dana Nessel's clip where you, all th you can hear all three of these Republicans saying, no, we should go back to pre-1965 and make birth control, all birth control, including condoms, illegal. It's over at HartmanReport.com.